Welcome, and thanks for joining me again as we continue our study in the book of Colossians. My name is Mark Rogers, and I'm the pastor of Kenmore Community Church. And it's, again, just a blessing to be able to share God's Word with you each week. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are blessed once again by this day and just the opportunity to connect with you and to learn from your word and I pray uh, Lord for uh, each one of us that we might just trust in uh, your sovereign control over all things trust in your infinite wisdom trust in your perfect love trust in your unlimited power knowing that nothing is impossible for you Lord and I pray that each one of us would be filled with your spirit that the fruit of the spirit would be evident in our lives and that, Father, we would become more and more like Jesus in our thoughts, our attitudes, and our actions. I pray that you would minister to each one through your Spirit, Lord. I know there are many that are having uh, health problems these days, so we pray for your healing touch there. We pray for those that are dealing with financial stress in their life, that you would provide for them. We pray for those that are dealing with uh, anxieties and and other concerns that your peace that passes understanding would guard their heart and their mind in Christ Jesus. And Father, we pray for our nation today. Uh, we pray for uh, um, just healing uh, from this COVID-19 virus, not only in our nation, but around the world. Uh, we pray for the issues around uh, racial injustice. We pray, Father, for uh, solutions to those problems. We pray that we could be kind to one another and love our neighbor as ourself. And we just pray for great wisdom and guidance for the political leaders that are um, working to uh, resolve and work through some of those issues. And uh, Father, we um, want to pray today uh, for the uh, families of the week here at Kenmore Community Church. We pray for Lee and Mary Beth Williams. We pray for Kelsey Wilson. We pray for Nicholas and Radmila Artun and for Zach from our youth group. Lord, may they send your presence with them in a special way this week. May you encourage them and bless them and help them to glorify and honor you in all that they do and say. We also want to pray for our mission focus today. We pray for Stephen Barbara Wilkinson and uh, Steve's ministry there in, in the Philippines at the Cebu Theological School. Uh, we pray that... Um, as that school, like so many, have had to go to online learning, that the uh, students will be engaged and trained and eventually sent out, and that many in the Philippines will come to know Christ as a result of the ministry of that school. And we do pray for Steve's wife, Barbara, and her ministry in their local church, and uh, just for some of the health issues she's been having, we pray for healing there, and we lift up their sons, Paul and Timothy, as well. Father, may you bless them. And now as we turn to studying your word, we thank you for your word, Lord, and we thank you that it's living and active, and we pray that by your spirit you would uh, teach us today, instruct us, and help us to uh, learn from your word and be able to apply it to our lives. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we continue our study of Colossians, I just want to uh, give a brief review in case you're joining us for the first time today. The book of Colossians was written by the Apostle Paul uh, while he was in prison in Rome. He's writing to uh, a church in the city of Colossae, which is, uh, or would be, uh, in modern-day Turkey uh, these days. Uh, this church was planted by a man by the name of Epaphras, who was a student of the Apostle Paul. So Paul himself had never been here. Uh, but this church uh, began to have some difficulty with some false teachers that had entered in uh, to the area and were seeking to uh, uh, infiltrate the church and, and teach things that were not the gospel of Christ. And so Epaphras uh, travels to Rome and uh, seeks out Paul for his wisdom and guidance and teaching. And that's what we have in the book of Colossians that was then, uh, it was a letter that was carried back to the church at Colossae and uh, where these false teachers, uh, the teachings of these false teachers was uh, confronted by the teaching uh, from the Apostle Paul. So today we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 1 verses 24 through chapter 2 verse 5. So I encourage you to make sure you have a Bible 
close by so that you can follow along in the text as we work our way through it. But as I begin, I want to just share a, a cute story with you. It's about a truck driver who was hauling a load of 500 penguins to the zoo, and unfortunately his truck broke down, and he eventually waved down another truck and offered the driver $500 to take the penguins to the zoo. Well, the next day the first truck driver got his truck fixed and drove into town, and he couldn't believe his eyes when he, he uh, saw that the second truck driver was crossing the road with 500 penguins following him in single file. And so he jumped out of his truck and he ran up to the guy and said, What's going on? I gave you $500 to take those penguins to the zoo. And the man responded, I did take them to the zoo, but I had enough money left over, so now I'm taking them to the movies. Well, that guy didn't fully understand what he was supposed to be doing. Likewise, many believers today are fuzzy about their sense of purpose. Last week we focused on the ultimate uh, question of life by looking at the supremacy of Christ over his creation, his church, and in reconciliation. And we ended up uh, with a challenge to make sure that Jesus occupies first place in each one of our lives. As we come to this next section of Colossians, uh, we discover uh, the reason uh, for living. So if Christ is supreme, then we need to live as if he's supreme. And how do we do that? What is the job description for a Christ follower? And that's what we find in Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 24 through chapter 2, uh, verse 5. Paul uh, lays out a description of his ministry. And his ministry, uh, from his ministry, we can learn what our ministries should look like, what, what our lives should look like as followers of Christ, if we are living with the supremacy of Jesus in mind. So, um, take your Bible and follow along now as I read Colossians 1.24 through chapter 2, verse 5. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission... God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ, to this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you, and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge." I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So again, in this passage, we find six strategic statements which help us understand our job description as Christ followers. First of all, Paul tells us, that uh, we need to suffer joyfully for the gospel. Now we might not expect this first one to even be included in the list, but verse 24 makes it clear that Paul saw suffering as part of the job description of a Christ follower. Hear again what he said, Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body which is the church. Paul willingly and joyfully suffered on behalf of others for the sake of the gospel. The little word, word now does more than just provide a transition. Paul is rejoicing precisely because of what he has just written, and he's rejoicing now at present, even while he is in prison in Rome. Have you ever stopped to think about what the believers went through before you in order for the gospel to reach you? If we think back through church history, we see how many of them suffered in order to share the gospel and to preserve the scriptures and to um, 
you know, communicate the love of Christ to others. And all of that history has come before us before the gospel finally reached us. So there were those who suffered joyfully for the gospel in order that we might receive the gospel. Now most of us try to get rid of suffering when it comes our way. All right? When we're in pain, we want to relieve it. Well, Paul was different. He found joy in what he suffered. In 2 Corinthians 7, 4, he declares, In all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. And he suffered far more than most of us ever will. Listen to what he writes in 2 Corinthians 11, 24 through 29. These are some of the sufferings that he went through as he sought to share the gospel with the Gentiles. Five times I received from the Jews the forty lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in dangers from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? When Paul speaks of filling up in his flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions, he's not implying that there is some insufficiency in what Christ accomplished on the cross. As we learned last week when we talked about the supremacy of Christ in reconciliation, through his uh, dying on the cross, his physical body being nailed to the cross and his blood being shed, he accomplished our salvation. He reconciled us to God completely. There's nothing more that can be added to that. Uh, Christ suffered all that was necessary for the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, his death has brought us peace with God, and there's nothing left to be done except to respond to what he's done on our behalf. So the word Paul uses here, uh, afflictions, is never used of the sufferings of Jesus on the cross, but instead it refers to the difficulties and the troubles and the pressures that Paul endured as he sought to spread the word of God and to share uh, the gospel. Christ suffered in death to save the church, and now Paul suffered uh, in life to expand the church. Uh, a pastor by the name of John Piper writes that Christ's cross was for propitiation. In other words, he paid the penalty for our sin. Our suffering is for propagation. Christ suffered to accomplish salvation. We suffer to spread salvation. So part of the job description for being a Christ follower is a willingness to suffer joyfully for the spread of the gospel. Jesus said since the world persecuted him, we too can expect persecution. So don't be surprised by it. Be joyful that your faith is showing. Now what form might persecution take in our day? Uh, here in America we are not really familiar with what it means to be persecuted for our faith. But some of the forms that it might take might be ridicule or mockery. It might take the form of the loss of family relationships or the loss of friendships. Um, in other parts of the world, our brothers and sisters in Christ are very familiar with being jailed on account of their faith, even being uh, tortured or beaten on account of their faith. And uh, even some of them have suffered death on account of their faith. So the persecution of Christians is alive and well today, even though here in the United States uh, we don't necessarily experience some of the more severe forms of it. But nevertheless, part of the job description for being a Christ follower is a willingness to suffer joyfully for the spread of the gospel. A second aspect here, or, or a characteristic uh, a part of the job description uh, for a Christ follower, is to serve according to your calling. Look again at verses 25 through 27. Paul says, I've become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that's been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. As Paul likes to do, he refers to himself as a servant. 
Since Jesus was supreme in his life, Paul was fully devoted to follow him wholeheartedly. Now this word servant can be translated minister, and the word commission means management or stewardship. Just as a well-trusted servant would manage his master's estate, so Paul was entrusted with a special task, and that was to present the word of God in all its fullness. Paul was a servant, and his calling was to fully make known the word of God. Fully making known the word of God involved revealing the mystery that had been kept secret from past generations. The mystery that God is calling people everywhere to faith in Christ, Jews and Gentiles, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now in a nutshell, that mystery is the gospel of Christ. And I think Paul chooses that word mystery on purpose here because you may recall from my previous messages, one of the things that these false teachers in Colossae were trying to uh, communicate to the Colossian believers was that they had some kind of secret knowledge. These false teachers had, had secret knowledge that these other believers didn't know about and therefore they needed to learn from them and accept that secret knowledge if they wanted to be fully accepted by God. And Paul says no uh, to these uh, false teachings and reminds the Colossian believers that they are complete in Christ, that they have uh, all the fullness of the gospel has been revealed to them. But at one time uh, it was a mystery. Uh, it was not known to the uh, believers in the Old Testament other than through the prophets that there was a Messiah that was going to come, but they didn't know who it was going to be, and they were told that there would be this new covenant, but they didn't know what that new covenant would be, and so that mystery has now been revealed in Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Um, and so what uh, Paul is, is revealing here is that that was his commission. He was serving the Lord. He had been called to proclaim the gospel, this mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory, uh, to the Gentiles. Well, what I take from that is that we need to remember that we all have a calling. We all have a gifting from God. Jesus gave the great commission to all of his followers to go and to make disciples. But we're all gifted in different ways. Some may have a gift of music. Some may have a gift of, of teaching. Some may have a gift of... Uh, of encouragement or counseling. Uh, there's a whole list of spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 and a few other places in the scriptures. So we all have different gifting, we all have a slightly different calling, but the, the goal of all of our gifting and calling is to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, however we may gift, be gifted or called. We need to make that known. Uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit given to New Testament believers was a mystery in the Old Testament to the Old Testament saints. And after Jesus ascended to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to live within us, never to leave. Jesus told his disciples, on that day you will re realize that I am in the Father and I am in you. Now the Holy Spirit seals us for the day of redemption. In other words, the Spirit's presence in our hearts guarantees our ultimate salvation. Though we are in this world, we are not of it. God will continue to work in us until he's finished perfecting us. This forward-looking guarantee of perfection is what is meant by Christ in you, the hope of glory. The J.B. Phillips translation of verse uh, 27 in chapter 1 puts it this way. The secret is simply this, Christ in you. Yes, Christ in you, bringing with him the hope of all glorious things to come. This world or this would include our present transformation and experience of the kingdom of God and our resurrection and heavenly inheritance where we will finally experience the kingdom of God in all its fullness. So, <clears throat> again, the second aspect of, uh, of our job description as Christ followers is to serve according to your calling. And uh, whatever your calling may be, to continue to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, which is summed up by Paul in that phrase, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So do you know your calling? Are you serving according to your calling? God has a place of ministry for each one of us, and he's given us a unique shape for ministry, a spiritual gifts and a heart 
and abilities and a, and a personality type and all of the experiences that we've been we've gone through all of that uh, comes together to create your shape for ministry and so we need to serve according to our calling uh, there are no bench sitters or spectators in the kingdom of God we all have a calling we all have a gifting and no matter what that gifting may be uh, we need to to use that gifting and use that calling to communicate uh, the gospel to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ the third aspect of our job description uh, as a Christ follower is found in verse 28 and I've uh, titled it move people to maturity uh, Paul says, we proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. The goal of serving and proclaiming the gospel uh, has to, to, is to move people to maturity in Christ. Too many believers get stuck at a certain point in their relationship with Christ and, and they don't move on to maturity uh, to, uh, to become more and more like Jesus in their thoughts and their attitudes and their actions and that is why we proclaim Christ not just to proclaim Christ uh, but so that people will come to maturity uh, we need to uh, not be talking so much about ourselves when it comes to our faith but Jesus needs to be the hero of the story as we tell it so that people will see it's Christ in us working in us and growing us and Paul says uh, that we can move people to maturity by admonishing them and by teaching them. And the first word, admonishing, carries with it the idea of warning or helping to set someone's mind in proper order. Paul didn't hold back when he thought someone needed to be warned about what they were doing or what they believed. We need to be willing to admonish one another in a spirit of love as well as receive warning and correction when we need it. The second emphasis is on teaching, which refers to the clear communication of the Word of God. Instruction in creed and conduct is crucial uh, for Christian growth. Uh, Jesus left us the responsibility in Matthew 28, 20 to teach disciples to obey everything that he commanded. We need to look for opportunities to teach and we need to make sure we're taking advantage of learning opportunities. The goal of proclaiming Christ, as I said before, through admonishment and teaching, is so that we can present everyone perfect in Christ. Paul was a perfectionist in the sense that he desperately wanted everyone to become complete in Christ. The word complete or perfect means full grown or spiritually mature. Our job as a church is not just to admonish or even teach. We do those things in order to create spiritually mature Christ followers. We should all be in the process of growth, of becoming more and more like Jesus every day. The fourth aspect then of our job description as Christ followers is to work wholeheartedly with His energy. Uh, if we're serious about moving people to maturity, then we can't be passive or lazy. Instead, we must work wholeheartedly with His energy. Look at what Paul says in verse 29 of verse of, uh, uh, and verse 1 of chapter 2. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. When Paul says, to this end I labor, he's referring to proclaiming Christ and presenting believers perfect in Christ. He labors and he struggles under this task. To labor means to grow weary through hard toil. The word struggle comes from the root word in Greek translated agony. Both words were used of athletes competing in the arena or of a laborer working to the point of exhaustion. Paul uses this same word at the end of his life as he, re as he reflected on how he lived in 2 Timothy 4, 7. He says, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I kept the faith. We're called to lay ourselves out to become spiritually fatigued in order to move people toward full devotion to Christ. And I'm humbled by many people who minister here at KCC with that kind of determination. If you're tired and wiped out as you reach out to others, you're in the company of the Apostle Paul. 
But notice that Paul doesn't just work in his own strength. Instead, he relies on the power of Christ as he struggles with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. It is Christ in us who renews our energy and gives us the strength and the ability to keep laboring, to keep uh, encouraging people to grow to maturity in Christ. But uh, we need to, uh, you know, that's part of our job description, is, is to labor, to work wholeheartedly, but with Christ's energy, not in our own strength. Christ will renew us as we, we wear out of our human energy. Christ will fill us. Christ in us. Remember the hope of glory. The Holy Spirit dwells in us and the Holy Spirit will empower us to keep going. The fifth aspect of our job description as Christ followers is to enrich the lives of others. Uh, look again at verses uh, 2 and 3 of chapter 2. Paul says, My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul very clearly states that his longing is for believers to be encouraged in heart. The word encouraged means to call alongside, and the picture is a, of somebody uh, moving, trying to move a heavy object when another person comes along to help out. A discouraged individual has lost courage. When we come alongside, God can use us to pour some courage back in. And Paul gave similar instruction in 1 Thessalonians 5.11 when he said, Therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are now doing. We're to enrich one another through encouragement, and we're to do whatever it takes to be united in love. When believers are encouraged and united, they'll have the full riches of complete understanding, Paul says. As we take responsibility for one another, we'll understand and know Christ more fully. As we get to know him better, we'll discover treasures of wisdom and knowledge which are hidden in Christ. So at this point, let me just remind you, there's no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. We need each other. Jesus created the church because we need each other. We need to come together to encourage one another and, and to be united in love and to build one another up uh, to maturity in Christ. So let me encourage you or, or ask you to think about, are you seeking to enrich the lives of other believers through encouragement and love? That's part of the job description of a Christ follower. And then finally, final aspect of, a, of our job description as Christ followers is to, light in, to delight in obedience to Christ. Uh, let's focus uh, on these last two verses, 4 and 5 of chapter 2. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. Just as one germ can infect the entire body, Paul recognized the threat of false teaching. These teachers deceived by using faulty logic and by enticing people with words that sounded good. Their error was carefully packaged and presented, and Paul encourages them not to be deceived. Paul delighted in their obedience. Uh, the phrases orderly and firm are military terms. Paul is there with them in spirit, he says, like a general inspecting the troops before battle. Orderly soldiers are those who had no breaks or breaches in their ranks. The emphasis of order is on individuality. Everyone is doing his or her part. Firmness points to a solid front, while the focus uh, is on corporate strength as the soldiers line up in battle formation. So this military terminology helps us see that through our discipline in studying God's word and our obedience to it, we can be prepared for any kind of battle. We can be prepared to resist the teaching of false teachers. We must each do our part, though, and we must stand firm. So are you living in obedience, joyfully living in obedience to the commands of Christ, uh, delighting in that obedience? It will help you uh, as you seek to uh, resist the false teaching that is out there these days. As we study God's Word, as we apply it to our life, live in obedience to it, uh, we will recognize very quickly when we hear any kind of false teaching that is contrary to it. 
So how are you doing in each of these six areas when it comes to the job description of a Christ follower? Let me list them again. Are you suffering joyfully for the gospel? Are you willing to suffer persecution on account of your faith so that the gospel can go forth to others? Are you serving according to your calling? Do you know what your gifting is? And are you serving in that gifting and through that gifting proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ? Are you yourself maturing and moving people toward maturity? Maybe you're someone who's gotten stuck uh, in your walk with Christ. You know, you, you put your faith and trust in Him. You've received salvation, but you have not yet grown. Your thoughts, your attitudes, and your actions are not becoming more and more like Jesus. Well, if that's the case, then I'd encourage you to get on that path to growth and maturity. And as you do that, continue to encourage others along that path as well. Are you working wholeheartedly with His energy? Uh, sharing the gospel with others is not an easy task. Uh, serving Christ is not an easy task, but we are to do it wholeheartedly, but not in our own strength, but energized by God's Spirit within us. Are you reaching the lives of others through encouragement and love? And are you delighting in obedience to God's Word? These things are the things that uh, describe what it means to be a Christ follower. That's uh, our job description. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for what we're learning from this book of Colossians. And in this passage today, as Paul uses his own life in the, as an example to, to teach us what the uh, job description of a Christ follower looks like. And so I pray, Father, that uh, you would help us to be willing to suffer joyfully for the gospel, that, that you'd help us to understand what our calling is, what our commission is from you, what our gifting is, so that we can serve you in that way, proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to others. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to mature in our faith, to become more like Jesus, and to encourage others to keep growing as well. Help us, Lord, to work wholeheartedly for you, uh, not in our own strength, but energized by your Spirit. May we enrich the lives of others uh, through encouragement and seeking to be united in love. And Lord, may we delight in obedience to your word. And Father, if there's anybody listening today who's never put their faith and trust in Jesus, I pray today would be the day of their salvation. Today they would surrender control of their lives to you and uh, ask forgiveness for their sin, repent of their sin, and from this day forward move out in relationship to you serving you as their, uh, as their Lord, as their King. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me bring now the benediction as we conclude uh, this message today. Now may the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In Jesus' name. Amen.